thank you, thank you. Um, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, I love this. Let's all say it. Ah! <laughs> Yay. Um, awesome. We're going to be using our voices and bodies today. Just a little bit. Don't be scared. It's okay. You use your voice and your body every day in life. You're just going to do it in front of people today. Um, so uh, as Chrissy introduced, uh, I'm Ann Veal. I'm an improv teacher. Uh, I also design uh, like bespoke corporate workshops that use improv to highlight leadership and corporate adaptability. Uh, basically, I talk about play and make it have a point constantly, right? What is the point? Validating why we should play. Uh, and we're going to talk today uh, about the opposite. And I'm really, really excited to do this because constantly you're writing grants, right? You're having to cite studies and show how play releases BDNF, right? Uh, which is your brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is the protein that allows you to create new connections between your neurons. Great. Fine, right? But what we actually want to embrace, what I want to talk about today, is the pointlessness of play is the point of play. Um, so our theme this month is critical. Uh, critical is a pretty kaleidoscopic word. You might notice a theme to the backgrounds of my slides. Um, it's a kaleidoscopic word, right? When you turn critical a little bit. All of a sudden, all the pieces move, and it shows you a different pattern, a different picture. So when we think about critical, for me, the first thing that leaps to mind is the definition that's sort of like life-saving, but also life-ending, right? If you have a critical illness, that is one that could end your life. But the critical functions of your body are the most important functions, the ones you can't live without, your heartbeat, your breath. So there is something in that definition of critical that's both and, right? It is both life-ending and life-saving. Uh, and that's really the definition that I have latched onto because that's how I think about play. Uh, that's where we get into the evangelist nature of it, uh, that I say play can save us all. Um, the other definition of critical, the other side of it, if you spin that kaleidoscope a little bit, is when we get into thinking of critiques, we think of judgment, we think of assessing, right? And especially if you describe someone as critical, that's not describing them as a neutral assessor, that's someone who's telling you what's wrong with you, right? That's somebody who is looking for the problems. That is the exact opposite of everything that we are doing in play. In fact, assessing in general, it is something I'm going to get into because I'm an improv teacher, talking about play through the specific lens of improvisation. And yes, you are assessing constantly. You are looking constantly. But when we start unpacking what is assessing, it's not just observing, right? It's observing and making a judgment. And we're humans. We have natural reactions to things. We're going to make judgments. But what we want to do is try and release the need to do that. And so that's what I want to talk about today is the critical importance of play and also getting rid of your inner critic whenever possible. Um, so what I want us to do right now is we're going to stand up. <laughs> we're going to start with the easiest version. Uh, uh, you know what? Nothing is precious here today. Uh, if your chair needs to move, great. If your body needs to move location, great. Maybe make sure you're not in a place where you feel like this. Uh, and the first thing that we are going to do... I, uh, yes, I did look at you and I was like, this, this poor person. Uh, please release her. Um, great. Uh, I, I, I am going to do it, but I have a mic pack wedged in the back of my skirt, so I'm not going to be the best example of this as I normally would be. We're just going to shake out our bodies, and as we shake our bodies, let whatever sound comes out of your body come out, okay? Uh, and when I say shake, that's not a sway. This is a sway, right? Uh, Devin mentioned how great the word mosey was earlier. We're not moseying in a shake. We are shaking, right? So shake out your body a little bit and let out sound. <laughs> yes, freedom. Amazing! Now everybody be quiet! 
I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. OK, that's fantastic. Excellent. I was a little worried that we might be, it's early morning, oh, that we might be a little draggy. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're going to throw in one more fun thing. Uh, I'm going to call out, maybe make sure you have a little bit more room if you need to step into the center of your pod or out of your pod. Oh my gosh. Uh, and I'm going to call out a letter of the alphabet. And you are going to turn your body into that letter of the alphabet. I shall simultaneously call out an animal. You shall make the noise of that animal. Excellent. Here we go. Let's start with an easy one. We'll start with an easy one. P. Make a P with your body. And give me a chicken. Excellent. Let's make a, let's make a Q. Let's make a cue with our body. And give me an elephant. Amazing. OK, all right. I got to highlight. Uh, I, you're, you're already labeling yourself as my example person today. Um, but what's amazing is we created a cue together. Uh, we instinctively said. So this is a wonderful example. Uh, you, you can have a seat for like a moment if you want. Uh, this is a wonderful example of how we're going to talk about rules here in a second. Because when we talk about play, we talk about games, we inevitably talk about rules. Uh, and we live a life full of rules, right? Uh, the wonderful thing about play is that play has no rules, except the rules we define in order to make play happen. Right? Uh, and so the rules, I did say, make a letter with your body. Great, that implied a rule of I'm doing this on my own. Right? These brave folks said, you know what? To best accomplish the point of this, I'm throwing out those rules. I'm going to work together. Excellent, right? That is what we want to embrace in this, is let's get to what we actually want to be doing and let go of worrying about rules when they do not serve us. OK, click. There we go. Um, all right, excellent. Uh, we probably get up again. Uh, we had a nice rest. Uh, this, will be, this will be fast, and we might do, yeah, we're going to do 10 things. Um, you are going to walk around the room quickly. It, it can be right around your pod. There are lots of things. People have hats and ears and shoes and floors and banners, right? Um, everyone is going to point at a thing. You are going to see that thing. And then you are going to call it anything other than what it is, <laughs> right? So I saw this. I point at this. And I say, necklace. Ooh. <laughs> Excellent. So that's what we're going to walk around the room and do. Things to avoid. Because if you do this, you're subverting the point of the exercise. If I walk around and I say, necklace, earring, bracelet, I'm not actually disconnecting my label function. I have simply switched into, I'm not actually looking at the thing, and I'm not actually pulling something different. I'm just saying things in a pattern, right? So let's avoid that. Uh, you're self-policing. No one's going to call you out. I promise I won't, I promise I won't single you out <laughs> if you do that in this one. Um, uh, but we're going to move around, self-police, if you notice that. Just stop. Great. Excellent. Go. Yes. And we're coming back. Some of us are grabbing another coffee, another half muffin. Is that a halfin? Um, great. Excellent. OK, so what we have done, what we have done when you do this exercise, this is a thing please take with you. Doing this increases your neuroplasticity for about an hour, right? We, ha we are natural label makers. That is how we see the world. And what we do, the way that our brain is an efficient 
beast of a computer that is able to do an amazing amount of calculations, the fact that I can stay balanced and upright, the fact that I can make eye contact with multiple people, the fact that I can click this clicker while I'm thinking thoughts, while also there is part of my brain that's thinking about the things I have to do later today, right? My computer is doing all of those at once. Uh, and so how our brain functions to do that is it creates labels. And so we stop seeing things because we give it a label and we just say chair, balloon, person, cup, right? And I don't actually have to take anything in. I don't actually have to notice anything. And so what we want to do is interrupt that. It's a very helpful th skill, right? It's how we are able to survive. Uh, but it's also something that limits us in certain ways. It's something we want to be mindful of, and it's something that we can practice getting out of. So this is a super simple thing you can literally do every day when you wake up. You could do it once an hour every hour, and then probably live forever and be 99 and like able to learn eight new languages, right? Um, <laughs> And so what I want us to do right now, in your little group, uh, we've got these balloons. We're going to now play together a little bit. If you've lost a balloon, see if another group will throw you a balloon. Here we go. Excellent. Everybody has one? Great. This game is incredibly simple. This game is we are going to bounce the balloon in the group, and we are going to say our names. That's it. Go. Everybody has gotten a chance to say their name that's in a group? Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, continue to play with the balloon if you want. Continue to, continue to play with the balloon if you want, but let's quiet down. Uh, I recognize that I'm, I'm kind of torturing because I'm constantly going, be free, be delightful, yell and scream, and then I'm going to go, shut up, right? Because uh, we have things to talk about. Um, uh, but I want to... I wanna call out something that happened, right? Uh, so again, when we're talking about creating rules to allow play to happen, bouncing a balloon to me is one of the simplest, most beautiful types of play, right? Um, I know I have been at many a party where there are balloons on the ground, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some brave soul picks up a balloon <laughs> and throws it in the air, and we all know now there's a game happening, right? <laughs> Pop! Yes, I played the game, right? And what is the point of the game? The point of the game is not to let the balloon hit the ground, right? And how do I know that? I just do, right? I do because that's what we're already doing. And so we're going to keep doing more of it. The point of the game is not to create a complex pattern system and understand the aerodynamics of the balloon. The game is just to keep the game going, right? So one of the core elements of play is that it's self-generative. Uh, when I talk about, yes, I've been waiting. Um, exactly. Play is self-generative. The point, it's why sports aren't really play, right? Uh, because sports have a purpose. Someone wins, someone loses, and it ends. Play, pure, true, free play, does not actually end, right? It ends because we are tired of doing it, right? Bouncing the balloon ends because either it hits the ground and somebody goes, eh, I don't want to pick it up, and we all go about our business, or it continues forever, right? That's it. Uh, there is no defined ending. I guess if the host kicks you out, or a porcupine walks in and bursts all of the balloons, right? Those could be endings of it. Um, excellent. So this is where we are getting into play. Um, the, the critical nature of play, that dual life-saving, life-ending nature that I was talking about earlier, uh, is really summed up uh, by the term lila. Uh, if you read, if, if nothing else, 
please go read Stephen Nachmanovich. Um, if you are lit up or interested by this concept of play, he is the foremost expert on play and improvisation. Uh, in his book, Free Play, he starts it by talking about this term, lila. It is a Sanskrit word that means play. It actually means divine play. It is the play of creation, destruction, and recreation. And it also means love. So when I talk about play, we're really talking about that. We are talking about wholeness. We are talking about things that self-perpetuate. The point of play is to continue itself. The point of life is to continue itself. Those are just interesting corollaries uh, that I like to bring attention to. Um, there are a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of great people who talk about the point of play. Uh, if you want to listen, uh, Dr. Stuart Brown has an amazing TED Talk on it. We'll give you all of the stats, all of the information. You can go look up a million actual scholarly articles or listicles, right, that will tell you about the importance of play. But as I was saying at the beginning, I think that by focusing on the importance of it, by getting into the facts, by saying, yes, it releases endorphins, right? Uh, when you take time out to play, dear God, you can be more efficient when you go back to work. That's why we should play. When we get into those kind of frameworks of thinking about it, I think we're actually missing the biggest point, which is it's pointless. It has no culminating result. It has no outcome that we are trying to achieve. It is focused on being, right? Another amazing Stephen Nachmanovich quote is that play is where the noun of self becomes a verb, right? We are no longer a being, we are being. And so that is the nature of play that I think when we get a little over analytical about it, we start losing. The play that I focus on is improvisation. Um, uh, as I introduce myself, I'm an improv teacher. Uh, if you jump to whose line is it anyway? Uh, if you jump to uh, maybe you come from New York and you say, oh, I've seen Upright Citizens Brigade, I know what that is. Excellent. You know what improv comedy is, right? Uh, that is one specific type of improvisation. Improvisation is also jazz. Improvisation is also Kandinsky, right? Improvisation is conversation. Improvisation is any time you are doing something that you don't have scripted what you do next, right? So the, we're all improvisers. We're all improvisers, already. You're already a genius at it. If you go into an improv class, you might think, I am not a genius at this. I am very terrified, and I am not funny, and I am not good, right? That is because we have been trained to have all sorts of blocks. We have been trained to focus on outcomes. We have been trained to control. We have been trained to make sure that everyone knows that we're smart, that everyone knows that we're competent, that everyone knows that we're kind, that everyone knows that we're good, right? And when you are worried about controlling the effect, yeah, improv improvisation is really, really hard. Because what it is, is about trust and releasing control. Again, I get into the divine nature of it. When you trust and release, things happen that you could never expect to happen. Uh, my very favorite example of when you release control and you just accept what is, uh, I had an improvised play team. We did improvised Chekhov. Ooh, highfalutin art, right? Um, and we were, doing, we were doing a show at a college, auditorium full of people. And someone, it's silent. It's silent because it's art. And they know that they're supposed to be silent while art is happening. And some poor soul, thank them, knocked over their glass bottle of juice and it rolled down the auditorium <laughs> steps. Now, because we are improvisers, we all said, oh, yes, thank you. And what it became was an entire show about how our house that was, also, that was on a winery 
The basement was full of wine bottles, and the house was slowly settling and breaking apart. And so you would hear these sounds come out of the basement. And it was very Chekhovian. The house is breaking down around us, right? Um, and that only happened because somebody knocked over their bottle. Right? We never would have had that if we hadn't been present to an accident that was happening. Um, there we go. Uh, excellent. So this is like my personal working draft imperfect definition of improvisation. It is an ever-shifting tension of opposites that allows us to discover ways to extend creative inspiration through time. Right? When we talk about play, we talk about that divine inspiration, this creative moment of inspiration. Uh, everybody here today, because we are all human beings and human beings are inherently creative, have had that moment of creative inspiration. And it feels like crack. It's so good, right? But we can't control when it happens. So what improvisation is, is a way of us to approach work so that we can allow that creative inspiration to extend and continue and have as many opportunities to breathe as possible. Yeah. Uh, an ever-shifting tension of opposites. <sighs> this is currently what I'm saying with it. However, at the same time, opposites is inherently wrong, right? Because we talked at the beginning about life, life saving and life ending. Those are things that sound like opposites, but that definition of critical is both and the same, right? So when I say opposites, that gets us thinking in a binary mode. There is this and there is that. There is black and there is white. There is right and there is wrong. And that's not what it is, right? It's about finding uh, risk and care, and saying those are both very important things. Now, I can't define for you, you need 20% risk and 80% care, because some groups might need that, and some groups might say, we need 15% care. We're risk takers, baby, right? You, what you have to do is stay present in what's happening. So this ever-shifting tension of opposites we're going to experience it right now. Let's see if we can get up and make one big circle, everybody all together. We'll see how this goes. Fantastic. OK, I am going to say if we can adjust. So there, uh, we've got, it's kind of a lumpy circle. That's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. We're not looking for perfect forms. But we do want to be able to all connect. Excellent. So there are two things. Three things, I guess, that you need to be able to do successfully to do this game. Can everybody go, bah? Bah. bah! Awesome. You can do one. Can you turn to your left? Can you turn to your right? You can do everything in this game. Excellent. Uh, so this game is called The Speed of Fun. Uh, it's the, the great Chris Bays, who is a, uh, like the foremost clowning expert in America. Uh, it's one of his exercises. So what we're going to do is someone is going to have it, and we're going to pass it around the circle. Uh, we are going to do this on rhythm, so all of us are helping. Great. So let's start with something nice and easy with a rhythm. We're going to... Excellent. I'm going to get us started here in a second. I'm going to make that sound and movement that we all practiced earlier and were experts at. I'm going to turn either to my left or my right, who knows, and I'm going to pass it. That person can then choose to pass to their left or right, and we're going to pass it around the circle. Excellent. Here we go. Ba, 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 ba. Excellent. So. We already hit the fun of the game. The fun is when it shuts down, right? When all of a sudden all we are doing is I just have to go ba and I can go left or right. That seems pretty easy. And then all of a sudden our body and mind go ah! So we started on a nice slow rhythm. Um, I'm going to have, I'm going to choose somebody over there so that we can shift because I think otherwise We'll probably keep it in this range of the circle. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm probably going to choose one of those improvisers I know are over there. Hey, folks. Um, and we're going to pass it back and forth. This time, we're going to pick up the rhythm just a little bit, right? So let's try. That's more than a little bit. Let's slow that down.
OK, here we go. Ed, can you get us going? This game teaches us a million things about play, right? Uh, it teaches us we need very few rules to actually play, right? We need very little. We don't need a lot of mechanics. We don't need a lot of props. I mean, I love balloons, but we don't need them, right? Um, and what is fun is when it goes wrong, right? If we efficiently and effectively go ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Who the fork cares, right? Who would want to do that? But when we can get to that point where ha, 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 the freak out happens, we are laughing at ourselves as we make mistakes. Oh, what could be more freeing, right? And we are accepting that other people are laughing with us, not at us, right? Also, so freeing. Um, excellent. So I'm so sorry that some segments of our circle didn't get to this, uh, but you can take this home. It's very fun. Um, <laughs> if we had a smaller circle, it just becomes chaos when too many groups are doing it at once because you're hearing different rhythms all over the place. And the shutdown is no longer a fun shutdown, right? <laughs> uh, the shutdown is I'm crying. Um, but what, we, what happens when you do this with a group that is rehearsing together, a group that's trying to get connected and trying to play together, is what you are trying to constantly identify is what is this rhythm? This is the main rule that we are playing with. I can adjust that at any point in time. It's very hard in this size group. I was over here and I was like, guys, speed up, speed up, so they hear us speeding up, right? Um, it's a self-regulating rhythm, so the group can adjust it all together. And what you want to do is find that speed of fun. If we go too fast, it's shutting down every third person, and then we're not getting to play, right? If we go too slow, it's boring. And again, every group of people is going to have a different speed. Every group of people in a different moment is going to have a different speed, right? Excellent. Thank you so much. You guys can sit down. Yes, that gentle applause was for each other. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so when we talk about that ever-shifting balance of opposites, right, that one was probably, uh, whoop, there we go. Um, the idea, I said this earlier, of risk and care, right? Care is we need to slow down because we're going too fast for the group. Risk is, uh, this level of care has gotten a little boring, and I want to add a little risk in so that we have those moments of delight. These first three are all kind of synonyms of each other, but they're also all a little different, right? This idea of chaos and control, right? So control is I am making rules, right? I am making rules because chaos, especially when we are going on stage to perform with instruments, with our voices, with our bodies, with my paintbrush. Chaos is going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen. So we're going to create a certain level of group ownership control so that we can find that balance between chaos and control. Uh, free whoop, okay. um, freedom and structure, again, different ways of thinking about it. Different people's brains are going to latch on to different things. This is where uh, I think we get into why improv training is something I think that all human beings should do if we want to remake society. Um, it's not necessarily because I want all of us to be getting up and doing comedy scenes, though I would love that. I can watch like six hours of improv straight. Um, but what you end up having to do constantly is you can only be yourself, but while you are up on stage with other group, another group of people, you are a part of a whole. So I am constantly having to balance my focus on myself as an individual and my focus on the group as a whole. And I recognize that when I focus too much on myself as an individual, I am disserving the group because I am not having enough attention focused on them. When I have too much attention focused on the communal, um, some of us in here might uh, know what it is to be a martyr. Uh, I don't have any idea what that's like. Um, but when you focus too much on the other and you don't take care of yourself, you are also not serving the group because you are 
getting to a point where somebody else has to come take care of you, and not because they're choosing to, but because you have neglected your own personal responsibility over that. Um, and then the final one, uh, divergent and convergent thinking. Right? Uh, this is where it actually is the same thing as risk and care and chaos and control. Divergent thinking is what we did at the beginning when we said uh, platypus. Right? Uh, because I am looking at a thing and I am thinking disconnect. Right? Uh, and then the reason that we start with that is because our world, our lives train us constantly in convergent thinking. Right? How can I find connections between? How can I owe this and that? And that's very important. Right? A lot of improv is finding the connections. We also have to be getting away from or else we stay small and we stay safe. Right? And we stay in that ba, ba, ba mode of things. So how do we find the balance? There we go. Is we stay present in the moment. That is the only way. Because there is no label. There is no outside anything that can tell us. And what the truth was a minute ago is not the truth right now. And so I have to stay present. I have to stay now. Uh, it is why we are getting up. We are being silly. We are laughing. We are bouncing around. This is also akin to meditation, right? Um, I f personally find improvisation very meditative. Uh, I can do it instead of meditating some days. It just might take me up instead of taking me down. But what it is doing is creating the same space and the same lack of self-judgment uh, that I sadly focus on too much of the time. Excellent. So to practice being present in the moment, we're back to our small groups. We're back to using that balloon. Uh, does everybody have one? Excellent. Uh, this game. Awesome. This game now, the, the goal is the first person who bounces is going to say their name or any other world in, word in the universe, right? Any other world, yes. Uh, Pl Pluto, Saturn, right? You can name all of them. Um, They're going to say any word. The next person who hits the balloon is going to say a word that begins with the last letter of the word that was before. Can I see this other balloon? Yes. Uh, excellent. Can I have a word? Yes. Oh, um, Market? Excellent. So the word I was just given is market, tolerance, egg, go, oracle, electric, cat, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And guess what? Uh, I'm an improv teacher. If your brain isn't naturally attuned to this, that's OK. I've done this a bunch, right? Um, so. The goal is to say any word that begins with the last letter of the word said before you. If your brain shuts down, if you can't hear, if you can't spell, <laughs> that's OK. That's OK. What you say in that instance is your name, right? And you don't say your name with shame. You don't say your name saying, I don't know how to spell dysentery, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yurt is obviously the next word off of dysentery. Um, uh, you say your name proudly. That is an absolutely valid move to do in this game, right? Uh, if somebody wanted, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the end. I think we're all pretty playful here. Um, but if somebody wanted to just say their name over and over and over again, sure, that's OK. Sure, that's according to the rules. Is that moving at the speed of fun, right? Because my name, Anne, uh, hopefully people know uh, Anne of Green Gables and they know that egg and electric are going to be the thing to say and not naughty or no, uh, because Anne as a first name should have an E at the end of it. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but if, if I just say my name over and over and over again, every time the balloon comes to me, the next person can already preload, right? 
they don't have to listen to me because they know I'm going to say my name again and they know what that letter is. And they know, oh, okay, just have an E word prepped, right? And that allows us to not be present in the moment. Cool? Uh, a fun move could be say your name over and over and over again and then change it, right? <laughs> um, that's, that's what we in the biz call fuckery. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay. Somebody get going in the group. And you might find that balance of volume where you can hear each other but not drown out other groups. Okay, improvises. It's time. Uh, <laughs> all right. Fantastic. So uh, I'm seeing groups taking care of themselves in different ways, right? We stood up. Uh, we moved away from people. Uh, we pulled our chairs in together and were like, ah, the chaos around us, right? <laughs> we must focus in, right? And we took care of ourselves in these different ways. Some groups were playing with more risk than others, right? Some groups were popping that balloon and having to do like a, you know, like a tennis lean to grab it. Uh, and some groups were focused more on care. Right? We're focused more on cool. We can all reach it at the point we want to reach it. That's great. That's what your group, without talking about it, decided that your group wanted to do by just doing it. Right? Uh, we had some other risk moves. I heard escargot. <laughs> That's a tricky one, right? Uh, because I want to say tricky, not Ottoman. Um, and, uh, but did anybody else just to throw out, did you have a moment that surprised you? A moment that delighted you? I heard lots of laughter, so you're lying if you don't say anything. Excellent. Um, one of my very favorite little sort of like back pocket tricks in improv, if I start feeling myself uh, getting inside of my head, I start feeling uh, precious about making sure this thing is perfect and not messing it up, uh, I will start to say a letter and then say whatever word follows that, right? And so that might be Tarantino. <laughs> and then suddenly in this scene, uh, my mother is going, excuse me? And I said, I just watched a movie last night and it's sticking with me, right? And now I have to talk about and justify this whole thing that's going on. And what I did was just allow whatever was in my subconscious, whatever word happened to be floating there. I just read some dumb article about him yesterday, so it was wedged in there somewhere, right? If I said tuna, we would be taking it in a whole different direction. Um, and so what is the main thing we had to do to be successful in this game? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Right. So we have to listen. Um, and what listening is, when, when I say listening, uh, when we talk about listening in improv, yes, we are talking about our ears and hearing words. We are also actually listening with our eyes. We are listening with our energetic bodies. We are listening with our whole selves. Because listening is actually just the verb that gets us to Awareness, right? Uh, and awareness is really what we are chasing. Um, I, my, my other life uh, outside of improv and performance uh, is in the self-development world. They're actually the same thing. Um, <laughs> but there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of times uh, when you're an improv teacher, and I uh, assume you all have had the same experience, um, where... <laughs> You're, a student is asking you to give them notes, right? What can I do to get better at improv? And the only thing I can think of is, go to therapy. Because <laughs> I'm not your therapist, and like your problem right now is you have an insane need to control absolutely everything that's happening all around you, and that's not something that's just showing up here, right? <laughs> that's something that is showing up here because it's inside every fiber of your being. Um, so in the self-development world, uh, we, I talk about the fact that you can't experience and process at the same time, right? So sometimes when people are going through something, they are feeling something, um, especially like grief, right? We want to try and hurry through that experience of it and get to the processing of it because that's how we can be done with it. 
but you cannot do the two things at the same time. They are very different brain functions, and they are functions that have to alternate. In that same way that divergent and convergent thinking have to alternate, in that same way that we can't be doing chaos and control at the same time, we have to be constantly shifting between the two. In the same way, you can't experience and process. And so processing is, again, what we are told to do all day, every day. Listen to what someone is saying so that I can process that information, so that I can figure out how to apply it to my job, right? I'm not actually listening to what you're saying. I'm listening to the things I need to hear within what you are saying. And so improv is an amazing way to remind us to stop processing sometimes, to just experience and be aware. And this takes us back to when we're talking about critical and that idea of critiquing and assessing and judging constantly. There are some times where, uh, when you talk about critique especially, it can get into thinking about like, well, I'm just paying attention, right? I'm seeing it and I'm seeing what's good and what's bad. That's what happens because I'm paying attention. And what we can do is actually pay as much attention, but not judge, right? Not get into that's good, that's bad, that's right, that's wrong. It's just what is, right? Uh, so we did those 10 things. Time check. Thank you. Uh, excellent. So those 10 things that we got up earlier, and we named something other than what they are. Now we are going to get up. You can use the same 10 things. You can use different 10 things. I'll never know. Um, <laughs> we're going to get up, and we are going to point at a thing, see a thing, and we are going to name that thing as it is. What we are not allowed to do is to use the easy label that we put on that thing, right? So if I said, a resting spot. If I said, silver, industrial. Those are both valid answers. Table is the thing that we want to stay away from, right? Uh, and so take a moment, point at a thing, see a thing, and try and, if, if, what, if what comes to you is truly, I am looking at that thing, I am seeing that thing, and what comes out is Tom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fine, right? Uh, and you are the only one who will know if that came out of that feels like that's what this is, versus eh, farts, right? Like, versus whatever, I'm just saying something. So try and open up that awareness to see a thing and call it what it is that's not the label. If that confuses you, great. Don't worry. There are no rights and wrongs. Excellent. Let's get up and do those 10 things. OK, excellent. Lovely. So. Nobody can know if you were right or wrong, because there is no right or wrong. Um, but suddenly, I mean, listening to things, and uh, Devin, you're up front, so I keep hearing what you're saying. So it's not that Devin is the best or the smartest. It's well. just I keep hearing things that he says. It's also, um, right? But suddenly, when I am hearing the way other people name a thing, I think about the thing differently, right? Um, I traditionally think of a rug as something I am on, but when I hear it called floor sweater, I think, <laughs> well, wow, it does nurture the floor in that way, right? I'm suddenly thinking about the relationship between the rug and the floor instead of the rug and myself, right? And now I'm going to go smoke weed and see you in a day. Um, <laughs> Our awareness is not something that can have a right or wrong. Our awareness is simply whatever we see, whatever we listen to with our whole beings and how we express it. Um, and that's something that we can nurture within ourselves uh, and to say, what is that thing that's not the label, right? Um, excellent. So our next exercise that we're going to do, uh, if People have heard of one thing about improv. What is the one thing, you guys can't answer, that you have probably heard? Yes, no. yes and, right? Uh, those are the building block words of improv. 
uh, within improv training, uh, we could digress. I think they have become almost meaningless. They have become themselves labels that people use to not do yes, but just say yes. To not do and, but to just say and. But for the purposes here, because we all haven't been ruined by too much improv training, um, we are going to get to what I actually think is the absolute core essence of yes and, which is seeing and being seen. Seeing is our yes. I take you in and I say yes to your existence by the fact that I am taking you in. I am adding something by allowing myself to be seen. And that doesn't mean like, what, I'm not putting on an invisibility cloak? <laughs> you know, like, but to truly be seen. And that is something that we get very self-conscious about because we are told that we need to have this result. We need to have a performance. We need to have these things that we are in life. And letting ourselves actually be seen as the messy, flawed, fucked up, broken, weird, farting, pooping beings that we are is a very, very vulnerable position. You don't poop? No. Devin doesn't poop. I shit all the time. Okay, all right. I should have known Devin doesn't poop. Um, but allowing ourselves to truly be seen actually risks nothing. If somebody sees you, what? Right? But it feels like something we really need to protect ourselves from. So we've been loosening up, laughing, being silly, being stupid, dancing around all day. <sighs> that was all warming us up for this. Great. Um, we're going to get vulnerable. And it might feel uncomfortable. The discomfort is, again, part of the point, right? Is recognizing that and saying, can I actually let myself fully be seen? Can I be yes and between the two beings? So right now, let's partner up and find a place in the room, you and your partner standing. Go. <laughs> Beautiful. So for this exercise, we unfortunately actually cannot have more than two. Um, great. This is the simplest exercise in the world. We're quiet now? Great, I don't need this anymore. Um, this is the simplest exercise in the world. It is not the easiest. That's OK. So uh, remember when we shook and made noise earlier? Let's just do a little mini version of that right now. <laughs> <sighs> Excellent. We're going to take a deep breath in. And as we take that breath in, we remember that we are at Creative Mornings, which is a deeply supportive place. And we are going to breathe out the stress and anxiety that the world tells us to focus on. And we're going to breathe in love and acceptance of your fellow weirdos. And you are going to breathe out judgment and criticism of yourself. Excellent. And now, for an undefined amount of time, I mean, I know the amount of time, but I'm not telling it to you because you'll start counting. We are going to make eye contact. That's it. OK? We all, we all immediately started giggling. We all immediately started laughing because we said, ha, ha, I'm so uncomfortable with this. So what I want us to do in a second, yeah, say hi if you haven't met your partner. Introduce yourselves. Let's, te let's take that deep breath in. Some of us are challenging ourselves and have already begun. Some of us are chit-chatting. Chit-chatting is not bad, but it's a thing we're going to phase out. And we're phasing out the chit-chat. I've lost control of the room. We're phasing out the chit-chat. We're phasing out the chit-chat. We're phasing out, diffusing our energy because we're scared of having directed energy in this eye contact. Excellent. And if you haven't already, face your partner. <laughs> Make eye contact. You can blink. You can blink. You can blink. 
I want you to try and see if you can really see this person's eyes. And we're going to be breathing, not talking. Because talking allows our energy to focus on our words. If you feel some sort of energetic defensive wall, almost everybody does. If you feel that, see if you can let yourself lower it. If you feel tense, there are some people who are giving themselves the gift of moving their hands a little bit, shaking off some tension. You can do that. Okay, torture over. <laughs> okay. Ah. Ah. My favorite thing is people diving into hugs at the end of that. So I just want us right now, I love that we are connecting. I'm kind of like mad at myself that I'm like, stop connecting with the person I just forced you to connect with on a deep level. Um, but just if we as a group, if anybody has something that they're like, the, whatever that you like needed to share with your partner immediately after, like let's share it with the group, right? Let's share it among. Uh, uh, moments, experiences, you had a good one apparently. Um, moments, experiences, things I felt, yeah. So I wondered why her eyes looked familiar, but she has my mom's eyes, except, <gasps> except my mom's are blue. Oh, oh. <laughs> Wow. And so almost always my scene will turn into some sort of soothing or comforting because that's what the person really is going through and that's what the person really needs. But when you get to the point where you are totally safe with each other, when you get to that point where you're like, I think we could do this forever, <laughs> you suddenly can, like, you, I, I've been on teams where you do things on stage that people go, how did you all know that that was going to happen at the same time? And you're like, I, we communicated through our eyes. You know, like, and it is, it feels like such an esoteric thing, but it is actually the most real, th I'm, the eyes are the window to the soul, right? We all know that phrase. And so uh, the challenge that I want to leave you with today is just to think about that and to think about letting yourself be seen it's kind of creepy to decide that you're going to see somebody who has not like agreed to that with you. Um, I, I, used, I, used to, I used to play that on the subway in New York, uh, but then you become that person on the train. Um, uh, but that idea of letting yourself, that energy, when you realize like, if you were one of those people who was like, oh, I have that wall up, how can I let that wall melt? Think about existing in that way. Like take a moment of mindfulness when you're in a room with other people to let that wall down and let yourself be seen. Because you will find in allowing yourself to be seen, it is the quickest and easiest way to activate your awareness and let yourself take in everything that's happening. To not laser focus, but to phaser focus right? Uh, and to take in the, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm a sci-fi nerd too. Uh, to take in the universe that is happening around you. But then the last thing I just want to talk about really quickly is um, if you were lit up by this, right? If you, if the idea of like play, that is not something I have enough of, right? Or if I do it, I'm doing it with my kids and I'm doing it for my kids, right? And not necessarily for me because I still have to make sure that they don't fall and bruise a knee or that their blood sugar doesn't get too high, right? Uh, and so I'm worrying about all of those things. If you want to find a place to play and maybe the idea of performing on a stage and doing comedy is not your jam, um, I work with a wonderful nonprofit called Unscripted. Um, uh, the she just had to leave. Uh, well, you missed the executive director because she's very busy. Um, but it's, uh, it's an amazing nonprofit that uses improv for other purposes than just performance. So there's improv for anxiety classes. Those are big. And if you had that feeling looking into eyes where you went, ah, it might be something to think about, right? Um, uh, and uh, I put a QR code up here. Uh, I'm partnering with them on a really... 
uh, dynamic projects that we're doing, uh, bringing improv to North Nashville, uh, which is a community that has historically excluded from improv, um, historically not included. And uh, they've been doing series up there, doing workshops, doing shows, something that uh, happens when you're trying to bring people into a fold uh, that have not traditionally been part of the fold is you want to make sure they understand why it's actually for them, not something you're forcing onto them. So uh, we worked with the community in North Nashville, uh, uh, Jump, which is an amazing organization, the Jefferson Street uh, uh, United Merchant Partnership. And they said that the businesses on Jefferson Street, the number one issue that they had that they cited as their biggest area for growth was customer service. And after doing some of the workshops and shows with us, their board member said, wouldn't improv be an awesome way to help people develop customer service? And so we designed this program that is going to allow the most diverse group of people to ever do improv in Nashville um, to be on stage, uh, but to be doing it for a purpose that also serves their lives, uh, because we're going to be increasing skills of listening, awareness, empathy, collaboration, and cooperation, which are the superpowers of improv and are also make you a super effective customer service person. Um, we have a super high funding goal, which is why there's a nice QR code for you lovely people here. Uh, because in addition to paying our teachers, we are also paying our participants. We are paying our improvisers in training from the community. And we are paying our community ambassadors who are working with us to make sure that this is not a parachuting in and telling people, here's what you need. It really is a collaborative, community-serving endeavor. Uh, so if you want to learn about Unscripted for yourself, you can go to unscriptedimprov.com. If uh, you thought that idea sounded cool and you have five bucks or more to donate, uh, you can click on that QR code. Uh, that's it. Thank you all so much.